Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at organicuniverse.com. Listeners of The Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. On today's show, Tom and I have a lot to talk about, especially with the latest news about pesticides, the beekeeping community, and other things that are going on with the environment. So I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, June. It's good to be back. Tom, how are things going in your neck of the woods with your bees? Well, it's fall, and things are beginning to slow down. The bees are still working actively on warm fall days, but uh, the days are much shorter. There's not as much bloom out there, and uh, the bees are beginning to close things down a bit. I'm getting ready for fall and candle making. The first item that I'd like to talk about is an article in regards to the Bee Informed Partnership National Management Survey. Yes, I've I've seen that, and uh, it, it's just filled with facts and factoids and figures and graphs. And the thing that catches my attention, because we've had such great concerns about the pesticide end of things, is that if you do a word search on that report, not once will you find any mention of pesticides or neonics or neonicotinoids. It puzzles me, frankly. Well... I guess what is interesting is how they went about calculating these totals. Tom, if you were going to calculate what the losses were in a particular region or even on a national scale, what criteria would you use? Well, you know, the basic uh, criteria is colonies, but you have to look a little deeper than that because we're being told that the number, the gross number of colonies has increased. I'm not sure that that's correct, but but let's assume that it is. The reason would be that the beekeepers are now pursuing pollination and they're, they're investing their resources in producing bees rather than honey. And even if they chose to produce honey, the honey prospects are not what they were 10 or 20 years ago. But in any event, They've invested the resources coming into a beekeeping operation in the creation of new bees, more colonies. And they've done this in part to try to uh, make up for the losses they're experiencing, which may be anywhere from 40 to 90 percent or more through the course of a season. So they may wind up nationally with a larger number of colonies than they had the year before or in the spring or whenever the reference point is. But you have to recognize that those are not X number of healthy colonies. Half or more of those colonies are are weak. They're inadequate or completely unacceptable for uh, pollination, for honey production. So Once again, you know, you can lie with statistics, and we're being told that there are more colonies of bees, but even if there are, it's not a healthy industry. Now, folks, I'd like to reference a section in this survey, which is called Years as a Beekeeper, and they show some very interesting charts. One is a pie chart, one is a bar graph, and it shows, according to color, the percentages of seasoned beekeepers, 10 plus years, to novice beekeepers who have been keeping bees basically zero to one years. 
Now, what I think is very interesting is that you have a pie chart that shows 20% that have been keeping bees 10 plus years in comparison to beekeepers that, that have been at it for two to four years. And basically, mortality is 27% for the two to four years and 20% for the 10 plus years. That just doesn't look right. Tom, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, we need someone who's prepared to sit down with a report like this and really take a, an educated, close look at it. it. We have so much stuff coming through on by emails and phone calls that it's very hard to to spend the time to evaluate things, these things properly. Um, you know, if, if the newer beekeepers are losing bees at a higher rate, I think that's understandable. Most of them are starting with packages, and there's a, a, a definite success rate starting with a new package. Um, there are lots of ways to interpret these things. I think the more telling part of the story is that we have beekeepers that have done it all their lives and they're having huge losses. These losses are understatements of the actual losses. That's not what's reflected in this comparison. The percentage of losses as far as the, the largest group appears to be beekeepers that have kept bees from two to four years. And the thing is, is that what they have how many hives? Whereas the commercial beekeepers that manage hundreds and hundreds of colonies, thousands of colonies, I just think that these statistics, there's just something off here. Well, I'm not familiar enough with the details of this report to, to say whether they are off or not, but I think it's not necessarily a completely accurate representation of what's happening. Let me say that. My suggestion would be that people uh, who are interested go to this report and and read it themselves and go over it if they're inclined with a fine-tooth comb and see what it really does say. I think it's really questionable why it makes no mention of the influence of, of pesticides and particularly neonicotinoids because they're a major player in these losses. It, it puzzles me. Well, if you look a little bit further in on this page where it's a survey question, and on the left-hand side it says years as a beekeeper, it shows the number of beekeepers that have kept bees less than two to four years is 1,150 people as far as people that responded to the survey that were valid, that offered valid responses, as opposed to people that have kept bees less than six to 10 years, which is um, the second largest group. And that's showing as 634 valid responses. And the people that have kept bees the longest, it says less than 10 years. The number of people that responded is 866. So in essence, this really is just a sampling of people that responded. It doesn't really represent what the actual losses are, but just represents, as far as the people that responded, what some of their losses are. But it's still, once again, it glosses over the problem. I think anything that relies on statistics and surveys like this has to be very carefully evaluated with a, with a critical eye. And I'll just go back to my experience when I was involved deeply in community affairs and advocacy groups uh, like to generate a survey that supports their position. And I did a little reading and research and I'd had a, a surveying class in college. I certainly was no expert, but I came across a passage that has stuck in my mind and I think it's very instructive and everybody ought to file it away for future use. And that is the statement in within the surveying world, they say adv advocacy groups use surveys the way a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. Now, is there a degree of this in this report? I don't know, but I think the readers ought to 
keep that in mind as they read it. I completely agree. On to the GMO front, there was some news that I don't know if it's necessarily new news, but it's been circulating that Croatia has officially taken a stand against GM crops. Now, what's interesting is, is that back in August, Scotland's government said that it planned to ban the cultivation of genetically modified crops. So, once again, it begs the question, what is the USA waiting for? Well, I think the USA is waiting for the uh, approval of the Transatlantic Trade Pact, TTP. What that would do is it would override the sovereignty of these countries. For example, if a product, pesticide or a genetically engineered crop was approved in the United States and the company wanted to market it in Croatia or anywhere and they said no, they would be taken to a, a corporate court, uh, a court composed of corporate interests and could be fined billions of dollars for loss of market. That's that's what's going on behind the scenes here. Uh, more and more countries are objecting to the genetically modified crops. We're seeing that on the part of the public in the United States, but we're seeing no movement on the part of the regulators or the legislators. Why there's so much of a delay, especially when people in America do not want this? It just doesn't make any sense. Well, it's money. It's money. You know, they don't want us to know what's in the food. They just don't want to be interfered with. They want to industrialize agriculture, and they don't want us to interfere. Well, Tom, as you know, the GM technology is the companion technology for the neonicotinoids. Where the GMO crops are planted, it creates a death zone for the bees. So if we want to be able to have a healthy and thriving beekeeping industry, we really need to think about these technologies that work in conjunction with the neonicotinoids. There's an interesting twist growing in this story, and that is that more and more independent studies, not corporate studies, but independent studies, peer-reviewed, are finding that there's little or no benefit from seed treatment with neonicotinoids, whether they're genetically modified crops or not. What it appears is that this has not been agronomy, this is marketing, and the farmers have been taken to the cleaners. Which brings me to the next article that I'd like to talk about. It's an article that focuses on beekeeping instead of the bees. And from what I gather, this pretty much blames the beekeepers, which is puzzling because if you think about a beekeeper who's a multi-generational beekeeper and has been working with bees for many, many years. Some of the folks that I've spoken to have been beekeepers their whole life. So to see industry apologists out there blaming beekeepers when the beekeepers are doing everything that they can to keep their colonies alive is preposterous. It's also wrong because it's interesting when you look at what they're pushing and if you really read between the lines, you'll see that it's basically nothing more than an extension of the PR, the, the propaganda that industry is trying to put out there to defend the use of neonicotinoids. Well, this is just part of the business plan. Uh, they're investing in the success of their efforts. Part of that is to control the message to to have these paid apologists who interpret the statistics in a way that support the interests of the chemical industry in this case, who are reading these articles, do so with a, a critical eye and question what's being said. Very often they'll make grand statements without any support whatsoever. Just you need to read these things very carefully. And there are a number of these paid apologists out there. And... Uh, just be aware. Be aware. These are billion-dollar products. It's The corporations think nothing of pouring a few million into this propagandizing. This one particular article, which was written by John Entine, it's, it's titled, Crisis Shift, Bees May Not Be Facing Apocalypse, But What About Beekeepers? And I just want to read a quote by Randy Oliver, which I thought was really interesting. 
He said, all this is economics, not catastrophe. Consumers may not like the higher prices for honey, but higher prices are certainly sweet news for beekeepers. As beekeeper and researcher Randy Oliver has commented, quote, the market for honey is offering opportunity for those not involved in pollination, and the market for bee sales is ravenous. Now, when you take a closer look and, and think about what Randy Oliver is saying, he is right. It is a market that is opening up for the hobbyists. And what that's basically doing is, yeah, it, it's it's making opportunities for people that are not commercial migratory beekeepers, but it's also really focused on the economics. And that's why there is such a big push by industry to negate anything out there that goes against the use of neonicotinoids in agriculture, or even in a domestic environment. We mentioned earlier that the beekeepers have invested their resources into producing more bees because they're following the pollination circuit. That's the cash flow. And uh, we've seen the lowest level of honey production nationally ever recorded in the last few years. And so honey production has not improved. There may be some beekeepers who have been able to maintain good crops of honey. But much of the the retail market, the wholesale market, has been dominated by imported honey. And I don't have figures at my fingertips, but a substantial portion of the U.S. demand has been satisfied by imported rather than domestic honey. The hobbyists can supply a limited market, but uh, it is going to be fairly limited, and their colonies are likely to be not as productive as those that are being managed for honey production by experienced professionals. All this truly is about economics, and that's what it's been about from the beginning. Had we done things from an environmental position where we were trying to truly protect the bees, protect the environment, as well as the people who are consuming the honey, as well as the different crops that the, the bees are used to pollinate, then we wouldn't even be having this discussion. But because it is based upon economics, industry has a lot to lose. But then again, so do we if this continues. You know, we've gone through a, a whole series of excuses trying to explain away these bee losses. And uh, initially they glommed onto the term colony collapse and they declared that it was a syndrome or a disorder. And it was this great mysterious black hole that was going to require years and millions of dollars of research. And when we began to call the industry on that, they kind of backed away from that one. And then it became... Uh, well, it's the beekeeper's fault, you know. They don't know what they're doing, and it's the beekeeper's fault. So all of these second- and third-generation beekeepers, beekeepers who'd been keeping bees successfully for decades, suddenly become bad beekeepers. Well, that began to wear a little thin, and, and now we're going to blame it on the hobbyists. The hobbyists are disrupting everything, and they don't know what they're doing, and one of the ploys of the industry is to try to get the beekeepers fighting amongst themselves. It's the old But they are. It's the old divide and conquer. Yes, they are, and they need to come together, I think, with a little more solidarity and and not let the industry take advantage of them as they have. Well, that brings me to the next subject, which is some really exciting news. Actually, this is in your neck of the woods, Tom. The Colorado Professional Beekeepers Association was just recently formed, and it is actually being headed by Lyle Johnston, who is a third-generation beekeeper, and he has just been elected president, and I look forward to welcoming him as a guest on the show at some point to talk about his journey. So I think that's pretty exciting that Colorado has a professional beekeepers association because it's, it is very different what the professionals experience as opposed to what hobbyists such as myself experience. I mean, you know, it's it's a world of difference. So I think that this is a really exciting step in the state of Colorado. Well, Lyle is a longtime beekeeper, and I think uh, he'll he'll have some interesting things to say. I think everyone will look forward to it.
Also in Colorado, from October 1st to the 3rd, is the Western Apiculture Society's annual meeting, which is going to take place in Boulder. Now, this is a key event, not only for West Coast beekeepers, but especially for folks that are located in Colorado. The Western Apicultural Society is a nonprofit educational beekeeping organization that was founded back in 1978 for the benefit and employment of all beekeepers in Western North America. Its emphasis is on smaller operations as the needs of the groups differ substantially from those of the large commercial operations. And they have quite a list of speakers this year. Jim Doan is going to be giving a talk about the new era of beekeeping, as well as Dr. Susan Kegley. And Tom, who else is going to be speaking? Well, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity, certainly for more local beekeepers. And beekeepers will be coming from all over the country because this is a fairly big event. And to have it here in Boulder, I think, is is an honor. But in any event... uh, Jim Doan will be a speaker the first morning, and Jim we've interviewed on this program, and Jim is a beekeeper who's testified before Congress a number of times and has uh, been severely impacted by losses to the neonicotinoids, has been outspoken about that, and uh, the last time I talked with, with Jim, it looked like he was maybe coming back to life, beekeeping-wise, so... It'll be very interesting to hear what Jim has to say. Uh, Jonathan Lundgren, an agronomist from, I believe, North Dakota, will be speaking about the uh, efficacy of these neonicotinoids. Uh, He's generated some controversy because of his views. Marla Spivak, uh, who is a a well-known name in the world of beekeeping from the University of Minnesota, Marla will be speaking here. Many of the leading players in in this uh, world of bees and pesticides will be there over the next three days. It begins Thursday, concludes Saturday. Thanks, Tom. Now, the last article that I want to talk about appeared in Yale News, and it was published on September 29th by Miranda Escobar. The article is titled, Study Links Pesticide Exposure to Tremor. And it says, a new Yale study indicates that although pesticides successfully keep insects at bay, they may also have a negative impact on neurological development. And it says, research at the Yale School of Medicine has identified a link between prenatal exposure to a widely used agricultural pesticide, chlorpyrifos, and the presence of tremor involuntary contraction or twitching of muscles in childhood. The findings of this study contribute to the growing body of research suggesting that exposure to pesticides is associated with a host of neurodevelopmental issues. This study in particular was published in the Journal of Neurotoxicology on September 15th and brings motoric effects of pesticide exposure into focus. And if you'd like to read more about that article, it is available at YaleDailyNews.com. You mentioned earlier when we were talking, June, that the EPA has, has made some recommendations. Recently, the EPA announced revisions to the Worker Protection Standard. And basically what this entails is the standards that protect farm workers and afford them similar health protections that are already afforded to workers in other industries. And it's just interesting, especially since these folks are coming into direct contact with these chemicals and why they are taking this long to implement these types of protections is baffling because especially if you're working with a toxic chemical, they should have something in place to protect the workers. What do you think, Tom? These have been issues that are long standing and you know, I'm being a little facetious, but what the EPA would suggest is that these farm workers get away from those dangerous farms and maybe take a job at EPA headquarters where they don't have any aerial applications or seed treatments or that office environment is pretty safe. Of course I'm being sarcastic, but we've seen you talked about the the connection between chlorpyrifos and tremors. I was looking up something just recently and came across some studies that had shown a higher incidence in farmers of depression and suicide 
and it was making the connection between some of these agricultural chemicals. I think they all deserve much uh, closer scrutiny, and the farmers have, have been led into uh, an environment that's potentially very dangerous to their health, it, it appears. Well, I think some of the changes, some of the revisions that are really important are, for example, it says annual mandatory training to inform farm workers on the required protections afforded to them. Currently, training is only once every five years. Most people don't even keep a job for five years, especially with farmers and the turnover with farm help. This is kind of ridiculous. So this is, you know, a much needed revision. Uh -huh. Also, first time ever minimum age requirement. Children under 18 are prohibited from handling pesticides as they should. Expanded training includes instructions to reduce take-home exposure from pesticides on work clothing and other safety topics. I mean, you don't realize that when you're out in the field and you have this stuff on you, you bring that home into your home environment or you wash your clothes with other clothing. Say if you have a small child in the house, you wash your clothing with you know, clothes that have been exposed to the stuff. You don't know what the effects are going to be. So I think that these revisions are long overdue yeah i would agree uh whether they'll be put into effect or not is the question because it's one thing to put out regulations and a lot of uh, good words but whether or not it's actually going to put in be put in place at the worker level has yet to be seen well, one of the revisions is mandatory record keeping to improve states' ability to follow up on pesticide violations and enforce compliance. Records of application specific pesticide information as well as farm worker training must be kept for two years. I think that's quite interesting. I think the record should be kept for a lot longer than two years, but the record keeping should be something that they should be have been doing all along. In any event, I think this is a positive thing that they've made these revisions and hopefully more people will benefit from them. Well, I hope so. I think uh, the ultimate answer to many of these questions is to create an agricultural system that is not dependent on this continually growing input of chemicals. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Tom, thank you so much for participating today. It's, as always, you know, to be continued. Every week is something new, and, uh, you know, I have to hand it to you, June, for sticking with it, and uh, I spent a lot of time trying to understand this. It's a major undertaking, and uh, I encourage other people who think these are serious questions to, to spend time themselves. We need everybody we can get who understand what's going on here. Thanks, Tom. And, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. Next week... We'll continue with our exploration into the world of pesticides, especially the impact of neonicotinoids on the environment. Thanks for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.